That said, we are going to get into probably one of the most popular texts in the Gospel of Mark as we've been walking through this book for the last year, year and a half. Um, So if you have Bibles with you, we're in Mark chapter 10. I would say this is probably, I I, would almost argue, if there's one text that's been preached about more often that I've heard from Mark, it's probably this one uh, in verses 32 to 45. And we're right on the, the cusp of a section in this book where we'll talk about that during the teaching where the disciples are basically idiots. So uh, we're, co- we're basically coming to the end of that, uh, which is wonderful. But this one, uh, this will be re- really fun this morning. And then maybe I might tell you why I dressed up. So uh, let's read uh, verses 32 uh, to 45. I'm going to read out of the NIV this morning. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Well, Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray together. God, I ask in these moments as we... Uh, discuss this popular text that you give us a fresh word this morning through your Holy Spirit to each of us individually and as a body together as we discern the subtle and not so subtle messages that compete with us living out the good news seven days a week. In the name of Jesus, I ask this and everybody said, Amen. You know, every time I read a text uh, like this, especially this particular text, I think a lot of times uh, I... I'm like, okay, this is definitely something I cannot connect with. I mean, I would never, ever say anything like this to Jesus. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty blatant, like, you got, this, when I said disciples were idiots, this feels like one of those idiot moments. Like, what are you doing asking this kind of question, right? I mean, it's pretty bold, it seems. So what I hope to do this morning is to show you a little bit of how this is a lot more subtle than you think with us. And that this, this message rings a lot more true to us than maybe we want to admit. Uh, so let's think about this. I think if we were to have a conversation and we're just talking about things, and I think most of us in some way, shape, or form are probably a fan of somebody or a group. We would probably say, you know, if, you know, if I said Taylor Swift, some of you would be very excited right now. I'm not going to play in Taylor. There's no Taylor Swift videos, right? There's some Taylor Swift fans. If I said Coldplay, I might be one who hoots and other people, right? So you're probably fans of somebody. Maybe, maybe you even might go so far as to say you're a groupie or a Swifty, whatever, right? So like, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that you say that you're a fan of somebody. Now, it also happens with other things as well. I mean, you, you got artists, you got movies. Social media is a big deal that way now. So, like, you follow people on social media. Like, I, I watch, I, I mean, I, I'm ashamed and not ashamed to say this. I watch a lot of YouTube. Uh, and so I subscribe to particular channels, right? And, I mean, it's, ridic- <laughs> it's ridiculous. I looked at my list yesterday to see how many channels I've subscribed to. It's infinitely long. It's really long. I subscribe to a lot of channels. Um, and then, of course, you got the wonderful algorithm that shows you the kinds of things you keep watching. So if you go to my channel, you're going to see uh, golfing videos and cute cat videos and rug washing videos and anything Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, I mean, that's usually what you're going to find on my feed. But so I, I would say I'm probably fans of those things. And even 
I, I've, I've, over the last couple of weeks, venturing into that realm for our church, like even like put, posting some additional stuff on social media to get more people to, to get some likes. I, I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. I put a post out on Friday about, um, it's from the sermon from back when I said the Bible doesn't care about the creation evolution debate. I basically made a 60 second short about that. And b- by uh, 24 hours later, it had like 1,500 views or something ridiculous like that. Uh, people are like, yeah, really impressive, right? Which is going to feel really funny today after I talk about the rest of the teaching and how convicted I feel about that in some ways. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we all have the, our fans and our likes. And, and, and what's interesting is that our culture revolves around the cult of celebrity. And it's not just with social media. This happens with churches. We are, I mean, I am trained incessantly to worship the cult of celebrity in the church. Case in point, any type of conference that, you know, pastor's conference, church conference, you name it, that you sign up for, there's always keynote speakers, right? They put their faces on there. And usually those people are people who have either have like really big churches or they've written best-selling books or something like that where they have some sort of celebrity-ish type status, right? And, and, and it's like this, they, don't, they won't say it this way, but that's, it's like this inherent message that, okay, they're keynote speakers because they are successful, right? And that comes with a certain type of mentality and posture to it. And what I'm hoping to show today, it's probably a little different take than maybe you heard this text, that, that this kind of stuff comes out with James and John. So at the beginning of the text, we see very, I mean, Jesus gets very specific of what's going to happen. And by the way, in this little kind of uh, section between chapter 8 and chapter 10 here, these, these three chapters, this is the third time that Jesus has told his disciples what's going to happen to him. It's all in the same vein, except this time, he gets really specific. Like, I'm just going to spell it out for you. Piece by piece by piece. The third time this happens, and and you see this word. If you were with us last week, we talked about this word astonished last week. You remember this? If you were here last week, this word like astonished is more like shocked in a bad way. This was like, they they were shocked at what Jesus was teaching. Like, I'm not going to go along with that. Why would you ever say that? That's not how the Messiah should be. That's not what I signed up for. That's the shock that they were. So Jesus says all this, and as they're, they're, they're going to Jerusalem, and they're astonished. Like, wait, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I had a vision of how the Messiah is going to go into Jerusalem, and this is not it. They're shocked. They're astonished. And one of the interesting things I specifically read from the NIV this morning, because there's other translations that do include us, but the NIV specifically leaves out a word in English that is in the original language that I think is extremely important. Now, other translations do have this, but even then, it's really easy to miss. It's the word edu. Can you say edu? It sounds like I do, I know. I do, I do. Now, it's not, it's not a vow you're making, but edu is the word usually translated, look, behold. You've seen that in the Bible before. If you've read the gospel, you see Jesus saying this kind of thing. Look, behold, right? Now, in other translations, you, you'll see some of this. But what it means is basically what I put in the screen. Pay attention. More like, hey, wake up. Listen. This is really important. Do not miss this. That tone that intention is exactly what you do is. That's what's said before Jesus says what's going to happen to him. Pay attention. Because obviously, this is the third time he said this in, the, in this little section of the journey, and they haven't been paying attention. Because their behavior has been getting worse and worse and worse. And this is kind of the culmination of it. And if you notice what the reaction James and John have after Jesus says this, Right? He says this thing that's going to happen to him. And then he says, then they just go on. We want you to do for whatever we ask. They completely ignored what he said. They didn't even pay attention to his words. Now it seems like, why would you not pay attention to Jesus? I mean, if Jesus was in front of me, I would pay attention to everything he says. Really? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Really? You would pay attention to everything Jesus says, because we would be remiss 
I mean, let's think about this. These, this is the 12 disciples we're talking about. Like the closest of the closest people that Jesus called, by the way. And they're still his disciples after all this is said and done. And they don't get it. And they ignored his words. Don't be so arrogant to think that you would be better than them. Or that you would, you would oh, I, w- I would definitely, because that's what the audience was thinking. The audience already knows where this story goes. They know, this is written after all this stuff has happened. I mean, we already know this is the gospel for Christians. We don't know about much about the content of Jesus' teaching, which assumes the people already know the story, so they're paying attention to how are the disciples responding? What's Jesus like? How are people responding to him? And the disciples ignore what Jesus is saying about what's going to happen to him, which is very important to the whole point of the book, which is how do you actually live as a Jesus follower? What does that look like? And we've already given you that hint a thousand times here that it's shaped by the cross. And they don't get it. But pay attention to the scene. It's really fascinating because I, you know, you think by this time, especially saying like this, and then to, at, to, to basically ask this question, which seems so ridiculous, hey, do whatever we ask. Jesus doesn't get indignant. He doesn't get upset. He says, let's go through the scene. Hey, what do you want me to do for you? He just goes along, right? It's like, hey, Jesus, I want you, just do whatever you ask. Why would they even think about asking such a thing? Because they're in. They're close. I mean, it's Jesus. He's a celebrity. And they know him. Not only do they know him, but Jesus chose them. And so now, like, hey, can we get some uh, backstage pass privileges here, Jesus? Right? Well, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. Well, we want to sit at your right hand, your left hand in glory. Now, that may seem odd to us. What in the world does that mean? And I want you to pay attention that Jesus doesn't get angry about this. He just lets them go along with this. And I I want to get the idea of what this means, because we've talked about this before, the idea of what the Jewish audience in the first century is looking for in their Messiah. You remember this? They want a military political conqueror. That is who their Messiah is. So if you're going to Jerusalem, what that means is this is the climax. This is the moment. This is the time where the Messiah is going to go into the holy city and kick out the Romans and be on top. And the Jewish people will finally be on top again. They will be God's chosen people, and they will rule. And when you are a people who have been oppressed for centuries upon centuries, which these people are, man, that's an exciting time. You've been waiting hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years for this moment and now it's going to happen and then jesus says this weird stuff that doesn't line up with that what they're saying is like look when we go into jerusalem jesus we know it's going to be tough we know there's going to be resistance but we've signed up for the cause we're all in we will fight for you to the death and we want to sit on your side in glory when we have the victory that's what they're asking now, for us, like, are we really going to ask for that, you know, today in the 21st century? Well, yeah, we just ask about it in different ways. And Jesus has been talking about his suffering for a while now. We've been tracking it. I mean, G- James and John, like, we're going to come out in a blaze of glory. It's so exciting. It's great. We sit on top. It, but wh- where they go with that is really fascinating. Because, I mean, Jesus kind of hints to it at the end of the text about what is currently happening, the way things happen. Because he's making a statement, because they're asking, they're really asking about power, right? Who has the power? And how do you get it? And how do you actually use it? And they have a particular idea what that looks like, and Jesus completely turns it upside down. The way that power happens in the world is that always at other people's expense. Always. And Jesus says, man, you, you don't know what you're asking. He's not angry. He's frustrated. It's like the, oh, 
you don't know what you're asking. They want to be on top, and they have this idea of how it's supposed to work. I mean, but the interesting thing about a people who is oppressed is that once you get freedom from oppression, how did that freedom get obtained? How do you treat your oppressors afterwards? What happens in the new regime, if you will, of those who are in charge? And many times, and this is recorded in the whole entire Bible, over and over, it's a cyclical thing. And it's still happening now. And it happens more often than not, is that the oppressed always becomes the oppressor. You rebel against methods and attitudes that seem destructive, and they are, and then what you end up doing is doing the exact same things, you just replace the names and the group of people. And that's what Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. You don't get what I'm doing here. And the cycle goes over and over and over again. This is where the cross changes everything for the kingdom of God. Because Jesus says, you think the way to power is through getting back at those who do evil. Through making them do what you would do, if it, you know, what you want if you were in charge. And what's interesting about this text that people want to ignore, when as soon as you talk about the cross at any moment in time, you are always making a political statement. Always. You, t- you mention the cross, that's politics. That's what Rome did. That's what the cross was. It was the political statement about the Roman Empire and how they ruled and who was on top and who has the power. And friends, I'm going to tell you, we all use the cross as a symbol. All of us do. The question is that Jesus is posing, how do we use it? Because James and John want to use it just like the Romans do. To dominate, to humiliate, to manipulate, to coerce. But Jesus, on the other hand, is hung on it. He's executed by the state, by the way, for being a revolutionary against the empire. He said this was going to happen. He just said it. He told them point blank, specifically, what's going to happen to him. And they say, we want to rule in a blaze of glory when you go into Jerusalem. And like, you're not getting the picture here of what this looks like and what a person who follows me is supposed to model their life after. Yeah, it is the cross, but it's totally different than what you think or what the world says. I love uh, he's one of my favorite New Testament scholars, N.T. Wright. You might hear me, I might be, I would probably say I'm a groupie of N.T. Wright if I'm going to say use their language, but he has a great, I, I love what he says about this. He says, this full and major Markin statement about the meaning of the cross in, con- in context is first and foremost, I like how he says, a political interpretation. The cross isn't just about God forgiving our sins because of Jesus' death. So you hear that, right? isn't just about, because that is important. It is about that. But it's also, uh, because it's God's way of putting the world and ourselves to rights, it challenges, and this is the important part, and subverts all the human systems which claim to put the world to rights, but in fact only succeed in bringing a different set of humans out on top. You don't know what you're asking. And then he moves on. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? You remember who he was baptized by, right? John the Immerser, the baptizer, the Baptist. And we talked about his his baptism being, you were being baptized into a national identity, a movement of Jewish people who are going to finally take their place back on top. Although people might have thought, was that just another revolution? 
like they saw with the Maccabees about 150 years earlier, where they had a period of 100 years where they were free from oppression. Guess how they got there? Through violence. And guess what? Did it last? Nope. It didn't. Can you drink the cup? Are you baptized? And <laughs> you hear they say, yes, of course. But they're thinking, look, the, the baptism is about signing up for this movement to be on top, to kick out the Romans, to finally be God's chosen people. We're the special ones. You have put your boot on our neck for too long, and we are rising up, and we will fight to the death. Yeah, of course I drank the cup. Yeah, I, I signed up for that movement long ago. That, I'm in. And Jesus says, yeah, you're going you're gonna to drink the cup and be baptized. With the I don't think you realize what that means. <laughs> I mean, it's basically what he's saying. Like, it's not going to, it's not, it doesn't mean what you think it's going to mean. And they'll find that out. In fact, I, Paul reiterates this in a letter to the Roman church. Chapter 6, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That is not what the disciples were thinking. Jesus is not going to die because he is the Messiah. The Messiah is not going to die. The Messiah is coming to reign forever. So there's no way he's going to die. And Jesus has told them countless times that he's going to die. And that is where he's going. And that's the baptism he's talking about. And they're supposed to join him. I, that's not what I signed up for, Jesus. That's what they say to him. I mean, they're, they're waiting. I mean, let's be honest. They're waiting for what their people deserve. They've been oppressed for so long. It's like, I mean, we're hearing this story again and again in all sorts of places, right? To be God's chosen people, to be on top, and to rule over everyone else. And, and what does that even look like? The ruling is not about, there's no blessing of people. It's like, we're, we're going to be the ones in charge now, and you're going to do what we say. That's the kind of ruling we're talking about. And friends, I would like to argue that that posture speaks to entitlement. The, 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 the idea that you deserve this. We are entitled to this because we are God's chosen people. And the way that we're going to get there is just like everybody else has done. Through the cross. Just switch the names from Rome to Israel. And now, but we're, we're backed by God because God is on our side. You've never heard those words before, have you? You think that's not happening now? That's entitlement. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. You have no idea what you're asking. And those who are of a posture of entitlement, and I don't, again, I would say, I mean, by, by the way, we live in a country that thrives on this. I don't have five hours to walk through you why we live entitled lives in America. But those with entitled postures always look to label enemies and they always look to label the other that's not like them and that those who are the other are beneath them. That is the posture of James and John. And by the way, the other disciples because when they get indignant at them, they're not mad because they asked a ridiculous question. They're mad because James and John beat Jesus or beat them to the punch to ask him first. No, we, were, we wanted to be sitting by your left and right. Who's the most important? Who's the favorite? Then they have a competition, which they already are having with each other. Which we'll get to that in a, a little second. So let's bring it closer to home. Because like, I, you know, like, I, I wouldn't ask Jesus this question. It just seems kind of ridiculous, this entitlement thing. Ah, I don't know if I'm really entitled, whatever. Well, most of you, in, in, if you work a job, or even if you're in school, I think a lot of times we're pressured in always trying to get to a better and better position or a status, right? So like if you're looking to for a promotion, for example, you're looking to, to get there. And we actually have a term, a phrase, 
we use to describe that, right? It's called climbing the ladder, right? We climb the ladder to better and better positions, right? So that we can get on top. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> we climb the ladder to get on top. Listen to that language. And this, our entire society and idea of what is good and successful, it revolves around this. It's the same way in school, right? Replace job with grades, right? Replace it with certain statuses that come with the type of grades that you get. You even talk at, the, at, the, at graduation in high school about who is the top of the class, and that is by your grades, right? And then people become a valedictorian. I mean, we are, and, and, and you want to pursue that because then you're going to get into the best colleges and universities. I mean, all the, this revolves around us everywhere of getting to the top. And I guess my question is, is the goal that Jesus is trying to convey to his disciples, is it the platform? You don't know what you're asking, Jesus says. For me, what, how this happens a lot, and I've thought, thought about this before, but man, I still catch myself doing it every once in a while, is what I call qualifying myself with people. You know, you have those keynote speakers and stuff you go to conferences about, but when you're talking in a group of people and you're trying to get people to listen to you, it, you especially in your group of strangers, you're trying to say, how do I get people to listen to me? Because if I just start speaking up, most, more than likely I'll probably be kicked out because, you know me, I put my foot in my mouth a lot, right? So how do I get people to listen to me more? Well, I qualify myself, depending on the conversation that I'm in. If I'm in a, a conversation about ministry context, I can, I can speak a little more to that. Where I say, hey, uh, I've been, you know, if I talk about even youth ministry, because I did youth ministry for a long time before I came here. I'm still in youth ministry here. Just, I'm a volunteer, which is wonderful, right? I just volunteer. It's great. Like, I've been in youth ministry for 20 plus years. I can say now that I've led a church, allegedly, for five and a half years. I say allegedly because yeah, I, I like that some of you are laughing about that. That's great, right? It's not our church, by the way. It's God's church. Anyway, so, but, but you know, I mean, we, we say those kinds of things. You can say whatever it is about your job. Now, because, and, and look, there's nothing against expertise, right? But we have this idea that only the experts have the final word on things. Why? Climbing to the top. Of course. I'm going to listen to someone that has all this knowledge and experience. And that doesn't mean it, they're not valuable. It doesn't mean that they don't have really good things to say. They do. But if that becomes the only criterion, then we're in trouble. And think about the disciples. The disciples were not those people originally. They were the B and C and D team. They didn't make it through school to be a good student of a rabbi. Only the top of the top were those people. They were the rejects. And now they're with the Messiah, the real Messiah. that Everyone's been clamoring for the Jewish people toward, and now they're in. And now, Jesus, we've been waiting so long, and, and I didn't think it was going to happen, but we're on your team, so can you just give us some privileges? I want the backstage pass. And for them, it's like, I want to be recognized as someone who was significant to bringing in the messianic age, which is like the, everything that every Jewish person wants to be. Hey, you know, I'm one of, uh, I'm one of Jesus' 12. But you know, we do this too. We do it in church. Right, we we qualify ourselves in so, so many ways. That's why you know if you use that model, being a part of this church is not very helpful for you. And I say it in a way because it because I've told you this before. What's the first question when I go to these conferences that people ask me about our church? How many people do you have in your church? So. 
So w- what is behind that question? Now, it, it's funny, because here, here's the funny thing. I've been to all sorts of sizes of churches. I've been part of a ch- church of 12,000 people. I've been a part of a church that's smaller, like 20 people. I've been in between. And it's so interesting when you're in those different sizes of churches, how that changes how you respond to that question. Because even when I was in the 12,000 person church and I was like part of a staff at this church, I thought maybe someone would listen to me. And you know what the next question was? What's your position at the church? It never ends, people. And I'm just like, well, what do I have to do? And I, and I, but, but I am trained, which is why a lot of seminaries who train pastors are having problems right now, of like, how do you train pastors to be the right types of leaders for churches? And all the training is about this model. And then what happens is we compete with other churches. Like, well, you know, Mike, you only have like 80 or 90 people in your church. And like, there's this pressure, like, do I, do I have to lie about the number of people in our church? Like, I don't even know, uh, and I'll let you know right now, I have no idea how many people really, like, are a regular part of our church. I mean, I can guess, but we have people watching online. There's people that are online, I don't even know who they are, until they email us and say, hey, yeah, I'm watching, I'm watching from some other state, and here's how I'm involved. Like, I mean, I don't know that answer. So I just guess. I say, oh, 80 or 90 or something like that. That's what I say. I, I don't know if that's true or not. It's a, that's a guess. I don't say 100. Once I say the 100, it's like, ooh, I feel like I'm pushing the limit of lying a little bit. I'm not really sure. But, like, there's this pressure to do this. And I, I, all the training that I, I – even now, it, it, that's why I say it's ironic with the whole YouTube thing I told you because I, we are trying to increase our presence. But the reason we're trying to because the people – you have told me – Man, it'd be great to get more people here, not because that's going to consider us successful, because we got a good thing going here. And you just want more people to know. And there's ways to do that, right? So yeah, I put out, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with that, but man, it sure is fascinating in that world. I mean, of uh, uh, putting out shorts and people commenting on it, and then what happens? I don't know what happens. But all the training I, I've seen around, and unfortunately now that I'm doing this, I'm getting more ads for these things, like all over the place, about Increasing your influence, increasing your reach, getting more people to follow you. All of that, that's all I get. And th- that's what I've been told exactly what successful churches do. I mean, people in bigger churches, my friends, who, who, they say, you know, well, don't you care about people? <laughs> what makes you think I don't care about people because of the size of my church? Are you serious? Do you? Because what's interesting is, like, I, I think about all the language we even use for getting people. And, and, and honestly, you, you're not a person. And I'm not, I'm not just talking, to, it's any size church. I mean, this is the model. You could be a giving unit, right? You can be an opportunity, right? You can be a guest. You see where this goes? It's messed up. This is all the same conversation that James and John are having with Jesus. It's all in the same vein. What does Jesus say the way to lead is? This is at the end. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. In other words, like the way to lead is to be on top and exert your influence over people. And we got to find the people who are more influential. Now, here's the thing about Roman culture. I mean, it's not just about, like, who's on top, but the way that you get there. Some people are born into it. But, I mean, even the whole social system, the way it's organized, suggests this. It's all over coins. It's all over statues. It's all over even the what clothes you wear, like today. You notice how dapper I look today? I was in a church where I didn't, I remember I I first got there and I didn't wear something like this. I wore something a little more toned down. And I was reprimanded by my lead pastor for not being 
professional enough as a pastor. And I said, I, I have no idea what that means. So I, I did, maybe because I'm not really professional. I don't know. I, I just, I, I didn't know what was going on. But like, no, you have to look a certain way. And entitlement postured people always care about what image you portray. Rome did. They put it all over the coins and statues. It, you, could not, you could not go anywhere without knowing who was in charge. What do you think the cross is? It's a picture. It's a symbol. It's a statement that you can see. You don't think we do this in churches? Of course we do. That's how the Gentiles do it. That's what, that's what you're going into. He says, not so with you. Instead, if you want to become great, Jesus, I'm going to give you the secret. You want to become great? Here's what you do. You must be, that you must be a servant of those that you lead. In fact, he, he says, whoever wants to be first must be, he even gets more aggressive, slave of all. I mean, why would you ever want to be that low of a person? That's like the bottom barrel, you know. Fill in the blank of whatever you think the bottom of the ladder is, right? Don't do that out loud. But like, I mean, that's, that's what Jesus is asking his disciples to do. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, listen to this. Man, I mean, this is Jesus' words. Did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served. If your posture as a leader is for other people to do things for you in the sense of you need to serve me, Jesus is like, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. No, the people who are my disciples in this kingdom serve others. They come alongside those, and he's already said the most vulnerable and marginalized people. You're coming down alongside them. And I would say it this way. People who are of the kingdom of God don't enforce the cross. They take up their cross. It's two totally different orientations on how to live. Followers of Jesus don't demand for additional rights or freedoms. The only right that you should demand is basic human rights, to be an image bearer. That's the kind of rights you can demand for people. But if you're a person say it's talking about freedoms and rights, I mean, taking up your cross is the opposite of that. That's why I get so fascinated by these conversations in churches that talk about these things. And they get, they, they, there's people like me from a pulpit who say these things. And I'm like, what Bible are you reading? Well, I would say you're probably ignoring Jesus' words, just like James and John and the rest of the disciples were. Followers of Jesus do not pursue to be on top. They don't seek to be the most powerful or influential so that they can give the enemy what they deserve and they make those labels. Followers of Jesus serve others. So maybe we say phrases like, do you know who I am? Or God is on our side. Or I've worked hard for this. We have the most fill-in-the-blank with whatever, that you should listen to me or us. Or look at all my, I've done this, bump, bump, fill in the blank. I put the blanks up there. You can fill it in with whatever you want. All of those are enforcing the cross. Followers of the Messiah serve and empower others, not demand service and loyalty to them. I mean, think about the disciples get really indignant about this, right? They, James and John beat them to the punch. I mean, they're like, we're part of the God's chosen people. We're the true followers. Yeah, I'm going to drink the cup that you're drinking, Jesus. And Jesus is like, you do. Wake up. Pay attention. Because it is so easy to ignore Jesus' words, just like, his disciples did. So let's ask this to close. Are you trying proactively as your priority, pursuing more influence? And do you do that at the expense of other people? 
I think a lot of times we don't realize if we're really doing that because we don't pay attention. Like we don't even know that it, it exists. And I would say that's one of the that's one of the evidences that you're in a, a posture of entitlement when you can't even see people. Are you seeking to create divisions on who's better than someone else? This is the, the competition part, right? I mean, we, I'm telling you, it's hard, friends. I'm not saying this is easy. That we, we are trained incessantly to do this. Like, even, even like, I, 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 I wrestle with the phrase healthy competition because it feels like an oxymoron. It feels like a paradox. It feels like it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, is competition really healthy? I mean, l listen, we live in a culture that thrives on a specific economic model that is all about competition. Capitalism, right? And capitalism, I'm going to, sorry to tell you this, it doesn't care about people. <laughs> it cares about profit. And people are just products to be used to fulfill that. And we do the same exact thing with churches. And then what happens is we start creating divisions on who's better at whatever. And maybe you don't do it as aggressively as maybe James and John did, but maybe it'd be like, you know, you might talk about a program at the church. You might even talk about me that way. You know, my pastor really has it all together. His preaching is way better than this other guy. Or this other guy. And I know you probably, I've heard that from some of you. And so first of all, thank you. I, get, I mean, I, I'll take it as, that's really nice of you. Secondly, I, I have no desire to be better than anyone else in that regard. I'm trying to be faithful to what God has gifted me with. And for some odd reason, for five and a half years, you put up with it. It's great. Right? Like, but we do this all the time in churches. That's why, like, I remember when, when people were like, when we, had, we did have, a, not too long ago, a mass exodus of people here which naturally happens with leadership transition, but also when there's a culture shift, which is what we have had. And the conversations within that, I, I think people were almost looking for a fight. They wanted me to, to fight and to, to draw lines in the sand. I'm like, I, I'm not interested in that. I mean, I don't know why you think I'm competing with the church down the road. Like, I, look, there's lots of great churches in this area that I would recommend, and I can help you go there if you want. I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just like, if you feel like, I'll do that. But I'm not in competition, but that's what we've been trained to do. And so, in turn, maybe the questions we can be asking as we're going throughout every day this week, who are we seeking to serve this week? And I would say this, add a caveat, especially someone who is being pushed down by someone else. I mean, we might call that someone who's being marginalized, right? Who's being told that they're less than somebody else. Jesus has a particular affinity to come alongside those people in an intimate way. Who are those people for you this week? I don't know who they are. You do. God's going to show you some of those people. Who are those people? And what does that look like this week? And are you pushing down someone to prop yourself up. Again, we are ingrained to do this. Like, we are taught over and over through very, many, very uh, infinite amount of mediums to do these practices. And that is practices that is exactly what enforcing the cross does. But a person who takes up their cross, you're, you're <laughs> that sounds bad, you're inviting a life of suffering, which is what Jesus is telling his disciples are going to happen. I mean, you know, 11 of, of these 12 guys, if you go down in history, 11 of these 12 did die for Jesus in the end of their life. They were executed because they actually got it. The good news is they weren't just idiots for just this time. They, they did get it. I mean, you're here because of that. And they died for that. But they died coming alongside those who were the most marginalized. Which obviously brought down an empire. Which was incredible. Well, for them, they sowed the seeds for it. It didn't happen right away. 
but they sowed the seeds for it. And friends, that story is still coming because the cycle keeps continuing. We can either enforce the cross or take up our cross. That is a question that will always be before us every single day, every single hour, for the rest of our lives. Which way are you going to follow? Because man, so many times, Jesus is like, you don't know what you're really asking for that's not where I'm going. I'm telling you where I'm going. It's the way of the cross, and the cross as this, something you're taking on, he, he suffered for us, and the blessing came out of that. All the, all the worst that humanity had to dish out came upon him. And he says to his disciples, that is the way. So what will we do to embody that this week? Let's pray together. God, I ask that you would show us all the ways that we are enforcing the cross and not taking up our cross. God, I pray that that so many who have been hurt by those in the church who have enforced the cross, Lord, that they were encounter what it looks like see you face to face of the one who takes up his cross who comes alongside those that others would say are less than human who defends the cause of the fatherless and pleads the case of the widow who serve and empower and lift up those that others push down. God, I pray that we would be that type of church. I pray that we would do that every single day this week and that people would see that that good news is right in front of them. I pray this in the name of Jesus, somebody said, amen. Let's all stand together. And just to hear this word of benediction, and before that, um, if there's something that came up and you're like, man, this is, yeah, there's lots of stuff I'm thinking about and you want to pray with someone through that or even if it brought up something else, Carol and Mary Ellen are here. They'd love to pray with you um, with that. Listen to your story. So please don't hesitate to go over there uh, after we're done. Let's receive this good word together. May you not enforce the cross, but take up your cross this week. May you serve and lift up others rather than demand others serve your needs. May you come alongside those who others push down and point them to the one who tells us to come alongside those that others say and treat as less than human. And may they see the good news lived in you this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we said, Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the podcast. If you want to connect with us, click one of the links uh, in the description there to get to our page where there's all sorts of ways that you can find out more information about our church community, uh, what we're doing, and how you can get involved with that. Uh, hope you continue to stay. Make sure you like and subscribe. Share this with your friends if you think it's meaningful. And hope you have a wonderful week. Grace and peace, friends.